130 years, it was locked in the grip of American sailors. It is easy to be a good winner, but in defeat lies the true test of sportsmanship. But now, since the dramatic races of 1983, it is the pride of West Australia. ESPN, the Total Sports Network, proudly presents the America's Cup Challenge Down Under. Hi, I'm Jack Whitaker, and welcome to the sixth in our series on the history of the America's Cup. The Cup match of 1970 was one of the strangest summers in that history. The first unusual event to occur was when the New York Yacht Club changed the deed of gift to permit a challenge from more than one country, with the provision that the first challenger set up a series of eliminations to produce a single entry in the September finals. Now, this produced the first dual challenge, the second time around for Australia Sir Frank Packer, and the debut of the French ballpoint magnet Marcel Beek. The single event for which the 1970 Cup will be remembered happened in this building here, then the National Guard Armory of Newport, and for Cup Summers, press headquarters. It was here at a press conference that the protest committee announced their decision to disqualify Gretel II from the second race, the foul heard round the world. Let's take a look at that bizarre summer through the last of Agnew Fisher's Cup films. began with the magnificent schooner yacht America, here shown as rebuilt by Rudy Schaefer in 1967. The famous old America sailed to England in 1851 and brought back the prize trophy that now bears her name. No man devoted more energy in quest of the cup than Sir Thomas Lipton. In the 100 years since the first challenge, he entered five times and lost, always gracefully. Here, Resolute, racing against Lipton Shamrock IV in the 1920 match, carried away her main halyard. Shamrock then sailed past to win the race. Winning or losing, Sir Thomas was ever the true sportsman. 12-meter sloops from three nations competed in 1970. Chanceger was built as a trial boat by French yachtsman Baron Marcel B. Designed by an American, Britain Chance, she was built in Switzerland and hauled in the dead of night to the Mediterranean. Next, Gretel II was built in Australia for Sir Frank Packer. She was christened by Lady Packer, escorted by Commodore Dixon of the Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron. I christen this yacht Gretel II. May God protect her, all those who sail in her. She had a good luck gift for skipper Jim Hardy. In Sydney Harbor, Gretel II sailed with Gretel I, which had been the challenger in 1962. Then both stood out into the Pacific for a series of trial races.
The America's Cup Challenge Down Under is being brought to you by Cadillac, America's luxury car. And by Olin Stevens is always the one to watch. In the towing tank at Stevens Institute, this one, his fifth America's Cup yacht, was watched by Olin himself on the right and Bob McCullough. Olin discussed his aims in the design. Combination of features more than any one particular thing. We've tried to do the the reasonable, possibly obvious things like reducing wetted area, concentrating ballast, uh, uh, distributing displacement in the right way, and that uh, these things have combined, I think will give us a good 12 meter. McCullough headed the building syndicate and would be skipper. 12 meter number 24, still unnamed, was laid down at director's yard in Mamaroneck. The dead wood of laminated mahogany was glued together. The hull, some 63 feet of it, was made of laminated wood frames to conform to the international rule. Bob Director helped to lay on the triple planking of mahogany. Then the completed hull was set down on the lead keel. On a cloudy day in May, number 24 was ready for launching. Olin Stevens snapped the colorful scene. Peggy McCullough was the sponsor. I christened the Valiant. Intrepid, the 1967 Cup Defender, got a new keel in the major surgery prescribed by Britton Chance. The designer of Chance Egger had a record of many winners in the 5.5 meter class. Moving the rudder aft and filling out the hull were among the things the doctor ordered. The old girl had her second debut with almost the ceremony of the first one. Her California skipper, Bill Ficker, stepped aboard and tried out the two wheels. They put him in a better position to see the Genoa. Then Briggs Dalzell, co-manager of the syndicate, presented him with a hard hat for protection against the low-slung boom. Bill chatted with Britt Chance on the right and Steve Van Dyke, his tactician. Harry Scheel, and Charlie Morgan, the Florida yacht builder, looked over the lines for another new 12 meter. This was a unique project for Morgan was the designer, builder, skipper, and sole backer of Heritage. Charlie put his heart and soul in Heritage and volunteers from St. Petersburg pitched in to help build the handsomest 12 meter of them all. The whole gang posed with Florida's pride and joy. Then she was hauled in the early dawn to the shores of Tampa Bay for launching. Glistening in the sun, the 70,000 pound craft was lifted by two derricks as spectator boats and hundreds on shore awaited the launching. Suddenly a derrick tilted its wheels off the ground. Heritage swung wildly. Her keel crashed against the truck, and the graceful shear was bashed into the lifting boom. Charlie stepped up to assess the damage. His calmness was amazing. He even managed to smile. The next day, Heritage was launched without incident, and Charlie went aloft to check the rigging. Then he took her out of the marina without a tender, just like that. It was good to get her under sail at last. The rigging was still pretty slack, and the flexible mast had some bends that weren't supposed to be there. Then snap went a backstay block. The crew eased the sails and the mast held. It was quite a day for Charlie Morgan. These old New England textile looms. The power plant of a racing sloop, sails can make the margin of victory for a cup defender. 
American sails like these at Ted Hood's loft are light, strong, and well stabilized to hold their shape. Final inspection is by Hood himself on board. Crew training starts at a tender age. Most America's Cup crews first got their sneakers wet on Long Island Sound. Blue Jays are the popular starting boat for juniors, one of whom got a good look at Valiant, out for early practice. Bob McCullough's brother Don was at the wheel for sail drill aboard Valiant. Winch grinders below don't get much of a view, but they can see the sails, which is what they're there for. The foredeck gang hoisted the spinnaker, and grinders trimmed the sheet to get a drawing right. Under the watchful eye of Olin Stevens. Jibe ho! The main boom swung over. The spinnaker pole was dipped past the jib stay. The guy was hooked on and the pole lifted again. Ready or not, Intrepid number 22 and Valiant were at the starting line for the June races on Long Island Sound. The eight races suffered from large amounts of light air. The first crisis came early. Valiant's light spinnaker blew to ribbons as the wind increased. How about this for alert sail handling? Seconds later, the crew had another shoot up and drawing. These early races gave spectators a good look at the 1970 breed of 12 meter. Valiant and Intrepid both showed flat decks with no winches and hardly a crewman in sight. In the June series, the crews were drilled in short tacking and spinnaker setting. Skippers and navigators got practice in starts and tactics that are so vital to victory in match racing. Rigging was tuned and sails tested under racing conditions. Intrepid needed new sails, and Valiant seemed lacking in rudder area. Both would soon have whatever was necessary. By the end of June, Valiant had outsailed Intrepid four races to two, but she lost one victory on a protest. McCullough was pleased with Valiant, but he knew he had problems, and bigger ones than a torn spinnaker. Intrepid and Valiant were alone for the first three days, then Heritage finally sailed in from Florida and got a race with each of the Yankee boats, losing to both of them. After her 1,600-mile passage, Charlie's Southern Bell was not yet properly tuned, and she was dressed in some sails that were not in style for the fast crowd she was getting in with. The crew was still getting used to the gear, so spinnaker setting left something to be desired. All in all, Valiant seemed to have the edge in June. Her sail handling was generally better, and she won the most races, which is the name of the game. mast was measured, weighed, and balanced. Then it was stepped, and France, together with Chansegger, made the trip to Newport, Rhode Island. Each member of the crew was introduced to Mayor Fred Olofsson by Bruno Beek, the Baron's son. They wasted no time in getting out for races with Chansegger. The skippers were Louis Novaraz and Pierre Delfour. When France was hauled out, sailing buffs noted the rounded bow sections. Her designer was André Maurice. The July trials were started from a committee boat named Incredible. Race Committee Chairman Devereaux Barker set the line for an Olympic-type course of six legs. Intrepid and Valiant circled on the starting line. Five minutes to go. 
Intrepid on the left was port tacked by Valiant right under the noses of the committee. McCullough acknowledged the foul, signals were lowered, and the starting cycle was begun again. Valiant's steering gear had jammed. This time, Bob got off safely with a good lead over Bill Ficker, but Valiant had a black mark against her for the foul in the eyes of the America's Cup Committee. Intrepid, however, went on to win this race. It was a key victory for Ficker and the rebuilt defender. Came the fog, and things closed down for two days. The Heritage crew was getting the bugs out of their boat, and Charlie Morgan treated her to a new mainsail. Their spinnaker setting was better, and they won a few races. The win over Valiant was particularly relished by the girls on the Heritage tender. The bright hulled southerner was hauled on a special lift after each race, and every inch of her was given that tender, loving care. Charlie Morgan seemed to be enjoying it all, though he still had a bucket of problems. Old Weatherly, the 1962 Cup defender, was useful in pairing to make a second race, but she also made a creditable record. Skipper George Hinman made good starts and was a real threat off the wind and in light air. In this race, seen from the Sloop Jubilee, he outsailed Valiant. Weatherly beat Heritage twice, but never intrepid. After the race, Hinman described the maneuvering to the press. The French sailors watched many of the American trial races to bone up on tactics. In the last race of this series, Valiant and Intrepid had a good beat to windward on the first leg. The lead changed twice before Valiant worked out ahead. A good spinnaker set at the first mark and Valiant was off and running. Bob showed the way on the two reaching legs too. The new Stevens boat was going well as McCullough drove her on to finish nearly two minutes ahead of Intrepid. Back ashore, Bob grinned his satisfaction and was congratulated by Bill Ficker. The July observation race is over. This was the time to dry spinnakers, recut sails, do maintenance work, and relax a bit. America's winningest sailor and his tough-as-nails crew are underdogs for the America's Cup. Find out why Wednesday night on ESPN. Soon it was out for practice again. A TV camera on Intrepid's tender recorded the sail handling for replays the same evening. They ran around a short course in Narragansett Bay. Up went the spinnaker at the windward mark, and the Genoa was hauled aboard. Intrepid's big white chute was kept trimmed just right by the sheet tailor. They went through sail drill just as seriously as the races and circling a one-mile course is a lot more work. Round and round they went, hoisting one sail, taking in another, breaking out the Genoa. <laughs> then set up the halyard, another thousand pounds. This was a well-run team under Steve Van Dyke and Bill Ficker. Anyone for touch football? If there was any energy left, or when Intrepid was hauled out, these boys would keep in shape at the seaside cottage they called home.
They all raced together on the New York cruise. There was a sound camera on Intrepid. Okay, come in your jail. 40 seconds, you need your speed, get it now. We want to get up to the line. Now, yep. How far on the You're line are we? Very close to the line, no problem being on the line. They were closely bunched at the start. Bob McCullough had Valiant close astern of Intrepid and ahead of Weatherly at this point. Current is setting you on the buoy hard. Stand by to jive. Okay, driving. Jive. Stay now. Stay now. Okay, his suit is up and it's full. Gretel, too, didn't arrive at Newport until two weeks before the races with France. So skipper Jim Hardy on the right and Alan Payne, the designer, set up a crash program of rigging, tuning up, and sail drill. Jim had crewed on Gretel 1 and was a top skipper from down under. They sailed every day possible to get used to Rhode Island Sound waters and try to make up for a lack of competitive racing. A practice jibe showed smart sail handling. But how would they do under racing conditions when the chips were down? For a trial boat, the Aussies hooked up with Ted Turner's American Eagle, a contender in 1964. It was August, and the final trials at the America's Cup buoy, plastered with Go Valiant stickers. Intrepid had her Ficker is Quicker buttons. Our camera boat was Panther 4, a pacemaker cruiser. Valiant started well against Intrepid. She led at the first mark. And then the wind shifted, so the last three legs were reaching back and forth. McCullough had 42 seconds on Ficker at the finish. It was a good day for the Valiant crowd. Valiant was paired with Weatherly on the 20th. You can't set a spinnaker much better than this. Weatherly had been beaten by an improved heritage and was now trailing Valiant. At the fourth mark, Bob's crew made the tricky jibe and spinnaker set successfully. But then, Bluey, in a second, it was just a bundle of nylon. Alert seamanship held off Weatherly, which was later eliminated by the selection committee. But George Hinman had played his part with the stiff competition he gave the other boats. Two days later, Charlie Morgan faced Valiant. Heritage looked better, but his rivals were faster too. Charlie's crew changes this late in the game could have been the cause of poor sail handling. Anyway, he lost this race, and the next one to Intrepid. On the 24th, Heritage was eliminated. It had been an uphill struggle with many heartbreaks for Charlie Morgan of St. Petersburg. In trials were run by a committee of Frederick Horn of Norway, Ernst Allers of Germany, and Beppe Croce of Italy, who was chairman. Jim Hardy had Gretel II as ready as he could after only racing against friends on Gretel I. And Louis Noveraz had France on hand after only racing with Chansegger. This was an historic moment, the first elimination races for America's Cup challengers from two nations a world apart. France, the first entry ever from outside the British Empire, was ahead at the first mark. A big spectator fleet crowded in as Gretel gained on the second leg. The Aussies inched by the French boat at the reaching mark, but minutes later, France was ahead again. Sir Frank Packer was down to his undershirt by this time. Again, the lead changed. With the wind dead astern, Novaraz called for a false jibe. The French switched the spinnaker pole over to port, but didn't jibe the mainsail. Hardy was taken in and jibed to keep ahead, so the Frenchman quickly swung the pole back to starboard, and France took off at a faster sailing angle to regain the lead. It was a real treat for the race watchers. A 
At the fifth mark, with France leading, Gretel pulled a neat maneuver. Hardy swung wide astern of France because his navigator had assured him that they could fetch the next leg without tacking. Gretel's extra speed carried her right through to lure to France. That was the ball game, as Hardy finished over six minutes ahead of Novaraz. Baron Beek boarded France. Although he had led at four of the marks, Louis Novaraz was replaced. The second race was also started in light air. France, sailed by Pierre Delfour, was to windward, but before long, Gretel crossed the blue bow and tacked to cover. On the second leg, Delfour used what wind there was to blanket Gretel Spinnaker and pass her to windward. At the jibing turn, they were overlapped and both flipped over together, with Gretel on the inside. The American final trials were being run at the same time as these races, but the bigger spectator fleet was here, and they saw one of the best races of the year. On the fourth, Hopi Del Four crossed Gretel with little to spare, and Hardy started a short tacking duel. Baron Beek was hanging over the bow of his cruiser watching the battle. A few tacks later, though, Gretel was able to cross the French boat, and Hardy flipped over to cover. Gretel seemed to have the edge going to windward, and she won this exciting race by some two minutes. Again, the Baron weakened his boat's performance by changing skippers. Novaraz was back aboard. Some of Del Four's crew were invited aboard Panther 4. There had been something about not doing their exercises in the morning. Madame Del Four joined in the demonstration, then waved to her husband, who seemed to be enjoying his discharge from France. Ah, c'est la vie. This, the third race, found Gretel again on top, but not by much. At the mark, France's spinnaker setting looked a little unorthodox but they got the shoot up quickly and kept the Genoa dry. Gretel was far enough ahead to win even after her Genoa tack let go and the sail went flying up the headstay. The French applauded the victory. Again, the Baron hopped aboard to make crew changes for the next race. This time, he would sail France, complete with natty white cap, jacket, and gloves. After a poor start, Baron Beek took off after Gretel as the fog thickened. France rounded the second mark and the third, but then it was a disaster. They circled around, hunting for the next one, and finally found it 20 minutes after Gretel. The Australians finished to win the series, and Tom Hardy waved congratulations to Brother Jim and Navigator Bill Fesk on Gretel. Then he poured champagne from the Hardy Vineyards. France, still in the fog, did not finish. The trophy for the series, honoring Sir Thomas Lipton, was presented to Sir Frank Packer by the Royal Ulster Yacht Club. At a press conference, Baron Beek was critical of the International Committee for not canceling that last race in the fog. In fact, quite burned up about it. The trials were down to just two boats, Intrepid and Valiant. Bill Ficker had number 22 ahead to windward as they were observed by the America's Cup Committee. The axe could fall any day now, but the committee kept them at it knowing that Gretel could be a tough challenger. Again, the older boat crossed the bow of the new Stevens sloop. The Black Pearl lent color to the late August seed. 
Intrepid was winning the fifth race in a row over Valiant. Would the cup committee pick her? Their secret deliberations were never revealed and selection would be announced first to the skippers. But not today. The committee ordered another race. Valiant led at the start, but Intrepid was close enough to catch the shadow of McCullough's mainsail. At the first mark, Bob was half a minute ahead as his crew set the blue top spinnaker. Intrepid had gained seven seconds at the reaching mark. Any slip and sail handling here could be disastrous, but both jibed perfectly. On the wind again, Valiant crossed Intrepid and Ficker started short tacking. Bob McCullough and his crew knew that this was a life and death battle. If they could only hold that lead. Ficker was breathing down their necks as the two boats split tacks. Finally, Valiant on a port tack could not cross, and McCullough was forced to come about. Bill Ficker soon crossed Valiant's bow and tacked to cover. It was the crucial moment in the long, hard-fought campaign for Bob McCullough and his Valiant crew. Intrepid won by nearly two minutes. It was August 29th. The America's Cup Committee came alongside Intrepid, and Commodore Morgan told Bill Ficker that they would defend the Cup. Valiant's crew cheered the men of Intrepid. Bob congratulated Bill and offered to help in any way. Then it was off to the gathering places and the first real relaxation of the summer. The year was 1970. Apollo 13 had been launched. Margaret Court Smith won the Grand Slam in tennis and the Boy Scouts admitted girls. In sailing, the protagonists were set, intrepid against Gretel II, that final series, when we return. Ted Barker set the line for the first race for the Cup in September. It was a rough, rainy, and windy day for the untested Gretel II, and for Intrepid that had raced mostly in light air. The wind was 20 knots out of the southeast. They started evenly with a slight edge for Intrepid. Ficker soon tacked to cover the Challenger as both threw spray in the choppy seas. It was rough on the small but hardy spectator fleet, too. Gretel's first error came when they got a monstrous wrap in the spinnaker at the first mark. Then on the third leg, with even more wind and rougher seas, Gretel was seen tacking completely around. All of a sudden, alongside in the water, a head appeared. It was Paul Salmon, who had slipped overboard from the foredeck. Both boats finished the wet and blustery course, and the first race was in the bag for the defender by some six minutes. It was more a matter of survival than racing skill. Intrepid was ahead of Gretel in pea soup fog when the next race was canceled. Finally, a nice sunny day and craft of all kinds fared forth. Old ones, new ones, boats with character, and oarsmen with endurance. Even the skies were full of race watchers, a balloon piloted by Bud Bombard, an ex-12-meter crew. An air view showed the largest fleet of the series, over a thousand boats. The Coast Guard did a fine job of riding herd on the wayward ones. Suddenly, the radio announced that Steve Van Dyke, tactician on Intrepid, had been bitten by a yellow jacket, causing a serious allergic reaction. The Coast Guard airlifted him to the Naval Hospital. Toby Tobin, Valiant's navigator, took his place.
So back to yacht racing. We look for a drop on a blue shape. We'll hoist a red cone and have one gun. Gretel and Intrepid circled briefly before the start at which the notorious foul occurred. They approached the committee boat with Intrepid to windward and a little astern of Gretel. Martin Visser, Gretel's starting skipper, tried to block Ficker's way. But after the gun, a lured yacht cannot deprive a windward yacht of room at the committee boat by sailing above close hull. But Gretel continued to sail much higher, almost head to wind, in clear violation of the rule. She had very little speed, but it was at this point that her bow hit Intrepid just after the port rigging. This was a poor tactic for Visser. He could have headed off and started well ahead of Intrepid. So the race went on, and a close contest it was between these two skippers, both from the far shores of the Pacific Ocean. Gretel, too, it seemed, was closing the gap between the Australian yachting ability and ours. At times, there was little to choose between them. Intrepid led for four legs of the course, but on the fifth, the Aussies slid past her. Gretel went on to finish a minute ahead, and the fleet went wild. Jim Hardy was handed champagne from the French tender. Both skippers protested each other for the start. The next day, Gretel was disqualified for a most unfortunate foul, considering that she had finished first. Another light air day, good for snaps of the Coast Guard's eagle. The girls whipped up some Lipton's instant iced tea, just the thing for waiting out the start of a race. Yachtsman Nori Hoyt and Mrs. Tom Hardy took a thirst quencher. Intrepid had worked into a good lead when they made the first turn in this, the third race. The team was intact again with Steve Van Dyke aboard. Bill Ficker's plan of close concentration on sailing while relying on Steve for tactics seemed to be paying off. Bill had things well in hand as the wind piped up to 18 knots. When Panther made the dash to the finish line, the skipper and the photographers got a face full of salt spray. Intrepid was showing her ability to cope with the seas as she won by a minute 18. Bill was pleased with her performance. Race started in a good 10 knot breeze with the defender soon getting the upper hand. Old hands at it by now, they got the shoot up and drawing smartly at the first mark. Films were heaved to the Coast Guard for rush wire service ashore. Never lost a one. Intrepid crossed the Aussie boat with enough to spare on the fourth leg. It looked like the end of the match, but Jim Hardy cut the last mark close. And on the final leg, Gretel started inching up on the Americans. Ficker failed to cover one of his very few errors and the race committee stared in amazement as Gretel crossed clear ahead of Intrepid within sight of the finish line. When Gretel finished, the spectator fleet exploded. Both crews cheered each other. Looks like Gretel got it. 
Sir Frank Packer said, just three more. It was the wildest celebration ever at Newport. fifth race was the best of the series, with the challenger having the better of it in the weather berth. The wind was a moderate 10 knots from the north. Hardy crossed the Yankee boat once, but Bill Ficker applied superior tactics to pass a boat that was faster under these conditions. The 28 races Intrepid had sailed against potential defenders must have given them the edge over the Aussies. Gretel was breathing bad air here for some time before they tacked. After 20 miles of racing, Gretel was trailing by only 20 seconds at the fifth mark. On the final leg, Intrepid poured it on to win by a minute and three quarters and thereby retain the America's Cup. <laughs> Bill Strawbridge, Intrepid's mastermind, joined Bill Ficker, but the crew had plans for their skipper. Jim Hardy, a great sportsman, swam over to congratulate Bill. A wet hug for Barbara Ficker and Dion. Even Commodore Clayton Ewing, a real blue water sailor, was inducted into membership in the America's Cup Swimming Club. He was welcomed aboard by Hardy and Ficker. Burr Bartram, head of the Intrepid Syndicate, kept a safe distance but was congratulated by a young admirer. Then the Aussies rolled on back to their dock in the Harbor Master's launch. At the press conference after the celebration, the two skippers exchanged sweaters. Jim had praise for the race committee on its handling of the series and for the intrepid crew. First and foremost, I'd like to congratulate Bill Ficker and his crew on the intrepid. The Lipton Memorial Trophy, awarded to the runner-up in the trials, was presented to Bob McCullough by Commodore Ewing. The America's Cup was again inscribed with the name of its defender, the victorious Intrepid. And the heritage effort. Join us next Sunday for Duel in the Wind. I'm Jack Whitaker. Thanks for watching. I wrote.